Today uh, we are very happy and pleased that uh, Professor Franz Kahn agreed to uh, give two examples for a special week for our students. So I will leave uh, most of the time for him and to students. And uh, let me just mention that uh, Professor Kahn uh, is uh, specialized in arithmetic geometry. Actually, he uh, helped to build the whole group of uh, Holden. So, and, and uh, as you can see the interaction before the lectures, he's uh, very kind to students. So if you have any questions and uh, you want to uh, talk to him, uh, please do so. <laughs> and uh, actually, he will stay here until next uh, next uh, next Saturday in the, our neighbor, uh, in the city. And uh, the talk, uh, the title of today's talk is Front Numbers. Please. Thank you very, very, very much for this introduction and for this invitation to give this talk and to Professor Ching Li Chai for this invitation to come to Taiwan. Now let me first say that I need your cooperation. Namely, any time I say anything which you don't understand, either my English or the mathematics, please interrupt. And if you don't do that, I will give uh, verses to <laughs> Let me briefly introduce for you the style of my talk. Do you understand my English? Yes, yes, yes or no? Yes. In my hometown, University, we face the problem that we teach mathematics, and the most efficient way of teaching mathematics is to give calculus and algebra and commutative algebra and geometry, and students are growing up in this way very fast, but lose interest. Why are you doing this? Why do you epsilon and deltas for three weeks in a row? <laughs> and why do you factor polynomials? Why? And another way would be to start with a very difficult problem, pose that problem, and then try to find all tools you need to solve the problem. This is very inefficient. Because most mathematical problems are extremely hard. If you go to a medical hospital and you have an MRI scan, a scan of your body, the mathematics behind that application is extremely deep. And there's no way you can teach that application to freshmen. So the difficulty is we want to build up mathematics step by step, theory by theory, on one hand, but we want to grab your intuition, your attention, at the same time. And this talk is very easy, has no deep theory, but this talk has a big danger. <coughs> Do you know this sign? <coughs> Yes or no? If you drive on the highway, this says there's a very dangerous curve ahead. <laughs> yeah. And the danger about my talk is for the rest of the year, if you will do computations about all the problems I'm going to pose for you. And some of the problems are extremely easy, some of the problems are extremely hard. And the main point of my talk is that it's quite often difficult to find out in mathematics which questions are easy and which questions are difficult. So let me start with an old Dutch saying, een zot kan meer vragen dan tien wijzen kunnen beantwoorden. Een zot is a very old fashioned word for a fool. A fool who doesn't know anything, who has drunk too much alcohol or is stupid by birth or whatever. So this is a stupid person, and a stupid person can ask more questions 
than 10 wise people can answer. So let me to be today for you the person who poses the 10 questions. <laughs> and the audience will be the wise men or women who will answer these questions. Yes? So that's the translation of this old Dutch saying. Then I have an advice, if you want to take notes, don't. There are three sources for have a record of four sources. Have a record. Well, first of all, there will be a paper in, in Chinese uh, recording the contents of this talk. So after this talk, I'll write down the paper, and then it will be translated. First, uh, or translated. <laughs> And then it will be published, so then you can read. The second source is, there is a beautiful paper by Don Zagay, and it's called The First 50 Million Prime Numbers. And you will immediately find this by going to Google, and Google Zagay First 50, and then immediately this paper will come up. So the second source is, don't take notes, but write down everything which I write down here. <laughs> and then if you want, you just Google <laughs> prime number theorem, uh, method primes, perfect numbers, and so on, so on, and so on, and so on. And immediately, Google will tell you everything which you're hearing in my talk. And much better, perhaps, than the printed version and my spoken version. So that's also something. Then, if you want, you can go to my homepage, and on my homepage, there's a paper, which is called Primgetalle, with prime numbers in Dutch. Uh, the Dutch is perhaps hard to, to read for you, like the Chinese for me, but the list of references in that paper is rather complete. So there are lots of references, and you can go to that paper and just see what, is the, what are the references. Okay, I need your cooperation. Please ask questions. Is it clear up to now what I'm saying, or do you have difficulties understanding my English? Okay, I hope that, that means yes. As I promised you, uh, I'm going to ask questions. And so here are the questions. <laughs> or at least six of them. And you will have them you will know what happens after that, because I promised you 10 questions, so there will be four more. And the first part of my talk, I will start explaining these 10 questions. You see, mathematicians are very curious people. They really want to know things. And quite often, people will tell you, or are you doing mathematics? Everything is known, the thick books, the, the library full of uh, journals. And people, non mathematicians think that most problems and solutions are known. And you will soon find out that most problems are unsolved. And that's also a mathematical theory. Whenever you start a new theory and you prove a theorem, then like mushrooms, many other questions <laughs> pop up. So the number of questions is always larger than the number of answers. And I will list today 10 questions for you. And what's the essence of my 10 questions? The essence is, it's hard to know where the question is completely trivial or very difficult. And if you haven't seen the question before, you may think, well, 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 this is a very difficult problem. And then I'll give you a one-line proof that it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll give you another problem, and you might think, well, it's very hard. But I'll solve it next, to tomorrow. And then it is ready for three chances, no problem. So these questions, the essence is that I want to present you, start thinking. So my first question is, 
how many prime numbers there are. And how many means could they exist? That's the first question. Are there finitely many? Are there infinitely many? If I take all prime numbers, large, small or equal a certain bound n, how many? So the first question can be split up in these, in these four. Okay, so let me first give you a definition. And I'm sorry if I'm going slow. The definition, a number which is in this set of integers, and I want only integers bigger than one, is called the prime number. If whenever you have an integer, Strictly between 1 and p, it implies that a does not divide p. And this notation stands for that does not exist in b in z such that it is. And of course, as I asked some of the students present here, can you mention the prime number? Of course, they said 2 is a prime number, 3 and 5, 23. And I know a very important mathematician who once came up with a prime number 57. Is that prime number? Yes or no? No, no, it's not. Very correct. Why not? Yes, divisible by 3. You know? Divisibility by three, you can test by adding all the all the digits. And if that 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 sum is divisible by three, then then and this is divisible by three. And of course, three divides to fifty-seven, so this is not a prime number. <coughs> and my first question is, uh, how many prime numbers are there? Are there finitely many? Are there infinitely many? After I've posed my 10 questions, I will give you a proof. And I have a little advice to you. It will happen to you quite often that a non-mathematician says, well, well, why is mathematics important? Everything is known, and you have a computer and you type, and then you immediately find everything you want. Now, the proof I give you will be four or five lines. It's easy, but it's pure thought. So pure thought, and I make a statement, is much, much bigger than computing. <coughs> That's of course not a mathematical statement, but <laughs> you see there are many problems which you can pose, and even if you have a huge computer, and you can put on the computer and then you can, can wait for two centuries to find an answer. There's a beautiful theorem by Euler, which you can prove in any freshman class. But if you ask the computer to do it, it's very hard. So the problem with this, you take the sum of 1 over p. So I'll give you an example. This, this is improvisation. So this is a half plus one third plus one fifth plus one over seven and so on. Yeah? And the question is, if you sum this up, is this divergent or convergent? Or phrased differently, is this sum bounded or unbounded? So let's do the little experiment you rent a large computer, <coughs> a really large computer, and you also do parallel computing, and you make this sum, say, for the first numbers of 2,000 or 10,000 or 10 million, and this you do for a full year, 
And then the sum will be about somewhere about 2 or 2.5. And then you ask your grandchildren to watch this process, and your grandchildren will see that after two centuries, the process perhaps it will come slightly over 3 or 3.5 or something like that, <laughs> depending on, on, you know, on the speed of your computer. And if your grandchildren think that computing is important, they say, well, this will converge, right? And oil approved. And the proof, if you thought, is really easy. And the proof by computing is very slow and suggests that it is convergent. And what Euler proved is that if you sum this up to a certain number n, this sum basically is the log of the log of n. So the log of 1000 is not very much. It's three times the log of ten, so that's uh, very very little. And and if you sum it up to ten to the power of ten, or ten to the power of hundred, right? Still, it's very it's very small because you take the log of the log. So summing this up is very slow, but finally it diverges. So this is a proof. So this is a statement. Pure thought is much better than computing. Proof. Is, uh, I'm making the joke. Okay, so this is one example. So this is question one. I have a next question. Uh, let me write P1 is the first prime number. P2 is the next prime number. P3 is the next prime number. And this goes on like this. So a number, all prime numbers, and I give the numbers like this, and in my talk, the notation P sub i will be the i-th prime number in this, in this sentence, right? And then you can see that the difference here is 1, that the difference here is 2, but somewhere you see the prime 23, and then 24 is not prime, 25 is not prime, 26 is not prime, 27 is not prime, 28, ooh, no, and 29 is prime. So here the, the gap is 6. Right? Question, let me take all the differences between consecutive prime numbers. Is this different bounded or unbounded? A mental note, a computer doesn't help you. Because a computer can determine the finite number of prime numbers and what will it say if, if you see that then certain numbers go up and certain numbers go down and so this is a question is it bounded or unbounded now I just want a little uh, uh, meaning of you some may think this is easy some might think this is difficult, and some have no opinion. Yeah. Can you raise your hand when you think it is easy? Can you please raise your hand? Easy. There's one person who thinks <laughs> two. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Do you uh, who thinks it's difficult? There are about twenty-five. Thank you very much. And the rest. Uh, as far as this moment has no opinion. Okay, so two people think it's easy, 25 think it's difficult, and I will answer that question. Is it bounded or unbounded? Um, so that's the question whether prime numbers are far apart. But I can ask the opposite question. Does it ever happen that prime numbers are too apart? And does that often happen? So, I question, do there exist indices i such that consecutive prime numbers starting as i differ by two? And such a pair is called a twin. A twin is when you when parents have two children born at the same time, right? That's, that's a twin. So, are there finally many twins? 
are the infinitely many twins? What do you think? Is this easy? Is this difficult? And we can get, ask the same question. Who thinks this is easy? Who thinks this is difficult? And let me point out, one of the main things in mathematics is where do you start? There's a famous soccer player, Johan Cruyff, he was a famous soccer player in Holland, and he has lots of philosophical statements and he says it's terrible if people start running but not know where they're going. And so you can start computing, you can rent a big computer and compute twin primes, but what does it help you if you find more twin primes than the inhabitants of the United States? Actually, there were more twins known than the inhabitants of the United States. Does that say anything? It's just a finite number, so perhaps that's all. Or perhaps it's not all. And then let me ask you the next question. Um, let me baptize the, the tripoid. How many tripoids are there? Tripoid is a sequence of three prime numbers. So the, you take a prime number, and the next one is two bigger, and the next one is four bigger. So let's try it here. 29, 31, and the next one is 33. Ah, that's bad, because that's a prime number, as far as I know. So this doesn't work. Either infinitely many, either finitely many. It is an easy question. It is a difficult question. It is this question more difficult than this? Or is it the same kind? Does this imply this, or whatever? So that's that's something, right? And so you Google twin, and you also Google triplet, and now say twin primes. So let me move on to the next question, but before I do so. Does any one of you have something to ask about this? Not the solution, not the answer, but <laughs> is it clear? The first question, are there infinite many or finite many prime numbers? Is that the clear question? The second, uh, is the gap between two consecutive prime numbers bounded or unbounded? And the third, um, about twin prime numbers, the finitely many or infinitely many. Yeah, so these are the first three questions I want to bring to your attention. Please, yeah, please. Suppose you have a compass and a ruler and you want to construct a regular triangle, so triangles of, yeah, of, of degree 60. And it's known in the ancient Greek time that this is possible. So ruler is compass. regular three gone constructible. 
And it was known that the regular five gone is constructible, and the proof is not hard, but I will not enter into this. this, this and that was the state of affair for almost 20 centuries. And people had no idea how to go further. Well, of course, you can bisect an angle. So this also means that the 6 gon and the 12 gon and the 24 gon and so on are constructible. It also means that the 15 gon is constructible because you just take the 3 and, and, and then the 5 that you measure the 2. So then the 50 and the 60 gon are, are, are constructible. And of course the 10 and the 20 and so on are, they are constructible. Question, are these all or are there more? More basic question. It is a question about philosophy, about Taiwan, about geometry, about algebra, about computer algebra. What is it? And actually, for 20th century, nobody knew what was the essence of this question. So they were in the language of Kruijf, they didn't know where to go. And then there was this great mathematician, Carl Friedrich Gauss. He was 17, and he was in the morning in his bed. And all of a sudden, he realized that there were regular 70 comes. And that was a very important moment for mathematics for two reasons. First of all, this implied that Gauss became a mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> he was considering, am I going to study languages and, 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 and things like that, or do you want to be a mathematician? And then he saw this beautiful construction, and he decided he wanted to be a mathematician. So that was one thing. But the other thing is, all of a sudden, Gauss proved that this is not a geometric problem. That this is not a problem of analysis or whatever. But that this is a pure number theoretic problem. Namely, he proved the following theorem. Suppose that n can be written as 2 to some power times P1 times Pt. And what are the Pi, the Pj? Mind the capital P, it's not, it's not a small Pi. This is a prime of the form 2 to the power 2 to the power i plus 1. And that's called the Fermat prime. So this is the Fermat prime. different. And now, what are the Fermat primes? The Fermat primes are 3 and 5 and 17 and 257. And if you go to Göttingen, mathematics department, there's a huge box in the cellar but someone made by ruler and compass the construction of a regular 257. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and then, unfortunately, nobody did this case. So <laughs> I hope next time I visit I will in the cellar here will be a box. <laughs> um, so, what is the problem about regular n -coms? The theorem by Gauss, uh, changes the problem from something geometric in existence of Fermat prime numbers. And any time you find a new Fermat prime number, you've proved construction of more regular n -gons. So this is not a problem in, in geometry. It's not a problem in analysis. It's a problem in pure uh, number theory. And the problem is, take the Fermat numbers, are they prime, are there any primes? 
Now, Google, turn on Prime. And you will find that these numbers, these five numbers are prime, and for the rest there are no Fermat primes known. You see these numbers grow very, very rapid, because you have two to the power, two to the power i. Um, a lot of work has been done in factoring Fermat numbers. And I think the record now is something in the 40s. Uh, the, the I until 42, I guess, is known to be non prime if I is bigger than I. And it was Euler who proved first that 641 divides F5. And now it's extremely easy because if you want, you take a, a scientific calculator you pin in two to the power to the power two to the power five plus one, and that computes it for you. And then you take the uh, factoring calculator. You plug in this number and immediately see that 641 six is, is, is a divide. So computing makes life a little bit easier, we think. But that's not true. I mean, the pure thought is much more important than computing. OK. so. This geometric problem isn't geometry, isn't analysis, but this is pure number theory. And the question is, how many Fermat numbers there are? Um, one of the things I'm going to do with you in the second hour, preview next in the theater, is that it's impossible to compute all prime numbers. You can compute many of them, it costs you a lot of memory space and so on and so on, but to compute all is impossible. So how would you ever say any theorem, any fact, proof of fact or whatever, about uh, prime numbers, large prime numbers? And you will see that pure thought uh, will help you a lot in doing that. Okay, let me go to question five. It's an old Greek problem. Suppose we have an integer. Suppose, for example, the integer is six. And you take all proper divisors and positive proper divisors. And by pure coincidence, it seems that the sum of the divisors of 6, of the property divisors, equals 6. Or if you add 6 and the divisor, then you put down 6. And you might think a little bit as an experiment that 14 do this. Let's see, 14 is 1, 2, and 7. No, 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 no. That, that doesn't work. And you easily see, if you do this by trial and error, that 28 is the sum of it. And this is the definition of, of, of a perfect number. 